If uh, you would turn in your Bibles with me this morning uh, to a couple different texts. Actually, the first one will be Genesis uh, 3, verse 15. So that's right toward the beginning of your Bibles. Uh, shouldn't be too hard to find. And then the second text is uh, Psalm 72. And uh, that I'm probably just going to ask you to, uh, to keep your finger in this morning and follow along as I'll be reading some of the verses as we go through the message today. But it's a great psalm that I hope you'll take uh, the time we can't really spend in worship to read that whole psalm in its entirety. So take that as a, as a challenge today to read through Psalm 72. And then um, I also want to look with you at the catechism this morning because, as Rob said earlier, we are in this uh, series on um, the Heidelberg Catechism, I Belong to Jesus, and right now we're looking at the topic of prophets, priests, and kings that we're called to be. So that's page 873 in the back of your hymnals. I just threw a lot of stuff at you. Take a deep breath. We're going to be okay. Genesis 3.15. This is after the fall into sin. So after the serpent has invaded the garden and um, they've been, Adam and Eve have been deceived by the serpent and uh, this is part of God's uh, speech to the serpent after that has happened. And it's a verse that's often looked at as a pre-gospel. So Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you, that is the serpent, and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He, that is the son of the woman or the seed of the woman, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And then if you uh, turn over to Psalm 72, that's where you want to keep your, your finger today. And then I'm going to look at Lord's Day 12, page 873 in the back of your hymnals. And this is where uh, question and answer 31, or question 31 asks, why is he called, that is Jesus, called Christ, meaning anointed? We talked about that a few weeks ago. And I just want to read the last paragraph that applies to him as our king. He's our eternal king who governs us by his word and spirit, guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. And then what does that mean for us as believers in the next question? Why are we called Christians? Because by faith I am a member of Christ and so I share in his anointing. And it says I'm anointed, and we'll look at the last part, the king part, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. And uh, this is God's word to us as his people. Thanks, uh, thanks be to God. So friends, in Jesus Christ, uh, the catechism tells us that we are kings which we should probably consider to be a good thing. Except, my guess is we're not entirely sure because we don't know too many kings who are a part of our lives anymore. In fact, the only king I can remember who was really a part of my life as I grew up was, was King Friday on Mr. Rogers. And I hear that even he's been demoted to prince these days. So we don't have too many um, kings to look at anymore, <clears throat> and we're not really sure what's expected of us as kings. Okay, if we're kings, what's actually, what does that mean, what's expected of us? Um, come winter time every year at uh, Sheboygan Christian School, where I uh, went to school, we used to play King of the Mountain. And the King of the Mountain was played when, the, uh, when it would snow, and the end loaders would come and they would scrape up all the snow from the parking lot and they would pile it up into one big mountain in front of the softball diamond backstop. And then one of us would climb up that snow pile and declare him or herself to be king. And then all contenders who tried to usurp the throne were somehow thrown to the bottom of the mountain or else they threw the king to the bottom of the mountain and they became king themselves. And uh, that's sort of how I think many of us view kings uh, today. They're sort of the, the, the ones who are, you know, ruthless and strong and commanding and forceful. They're the ones at the top of the hill. 
Um, today, they don't go so much by the title king as they do by, you know, dictator or president, we call them. And the name king is often reserved for people like, like King Charles over in Britain, who is more of a character, really, than a king. And yet, I think when you examine our culture a little more closely, you begin to see that there are still vestiges of kingship everywhere around us. Today, we might have different names for them, though. Many, one of those names, I think, is, is chiefs, right? We have chief executive officers and chief financial officers and chiefs of, of operations. Now, they may not wear crowns, but, but there's no doubt who's in charge of the tribe, right? Some of you may be the chief of, of something. Although we also have chief meteorologists like uh, Tom Walks and Brian Niznanski, I've always wondered what a chief meteorologist does. What are you chief of? Chief of the weather? Um, not quite sure. So that kind of, you know, waters down the title of chief. But, but you get what I'm saying. We've got these ideas of kingship throughout our lives. And um, even though we might use different titles today, it's still around. And most of us don't need the catechism to tell us that in some regard, you and I are kings as well. Because truth be told, we all want to reign over something, some aspect of life. We want to be kings of our homes, kings of the family, perhaps, kings of the marriage, uh, king over the yard. Some of us like to view ourselves that way. Um, king of the office, king of my body, King of my toys, king of the mountain, king of the road. It's almost like somehow we were created to be kings, like there's something inherent in us that wants to reign over something. And of course, we said a few weeks ago that our first parents were actually created to reign, to reign with God, that that was part of being created in God's image. God created the male and the female, and he called them to rule, and he called them to subdue. And they were involved in reigning in the way that God reigns. And we saw that, you know, God reigned by, by calling order out of the, the chaos that was present before creation. He created and he ordered his world, and then he called us and created us and set us in the garden to subdue the wildness of the garden and grow strawberries and straight lines and to reign over all of the creatures and to do it well like the dairy farmers from Dort. And so we have been, we have been tasked with this image-bearing responsibility that includes reigning. And what we have in Psalm 72 is really a beautiful picture of the ideal king, an ideal chief. And so if we are to be kings, this is a psalm that, that we ought to be familiar with so that we have a picture of, of what it means to be a godly king. And so I want to look with you this morning at this psalm and try and answer these questions, the what and the who and the how of, of being an ideal king, okay? The what, the who, and the how. So let's, let's start with the what. Um, what does an ideal king do? And if you look at verse 1 of our, of our psalm, the answer is, it begins um, like this. Um, the king, or excuse me, endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. And those two things answer the question, what does an ideal king do? He rules or she rules with, with righteousness and justice. And those are not just randomly chosen words or terms. These are terms that tell us a king, a godly king, is expected to rule or to reign like God rules. Okay? Those two words, justice and righteousness, those, are, are, those come up again and again in Scripture, and they're called the foundations of God's throne. They're the foundations of, of His throne. God is righteous God is just. These two things, therefore, are never absent from the reign of a godly king. 
And so look at how that plays out for the subjects of the king, right? Verse 2, he will judge your peoples with righteousness. In other words, he will always judge fairly. There will be no favoritism in his kingdom, no partiality. The weak and the powerful, the rich and the poor, we will all have to play by the same rules in, under his reign. Verse 3, the mountains will bring prosperity to the people. Prosperity, the word there in Hebrew is, is shalom. It's that word for God's wholeness, for well-being, for the way that it should be. Okay? The mountains will bring this kind of wholeness to the people. Now think about the mountains. All right? The mountains, nothing grew on the mountains, especially toward the tops. But having a godly king means that even the mountains are going to produce wholeness and fullness for us. We'll go on. The hills will bring the fruit of righteousness. Okay, and the idea of righteousness here is that everything will function the way it was designed to function. In other words, the rains are going to fall when they're supposed to. Not in the middle of harvest season when the tractors are going to get stuck in the mud, right? Everything is going to work the way it's supposed to and it will all lead to an atmosphere of goodness and abundance. If you look at verses 6 and 7, this king will be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. And you know what that's like this morning, right? It's been so dry, and you just have this feeling of, ah, it's right, it's good. In his days, the righteous will flourish. Prosperity or abundance will abound till the moon is no more. What's being said here is when you have a godly king, that king is going to function, like we said the first week, as a portal between heaven and earth. And that, that king will be the vehicle through which God will pour out all the abundance, the goodness of heaven, the goodness of Eden into the lives of his people, into the earth. And so a true king always represents the reign of, of God himself, okay? And through this king, all the good things that God intends for his people begin to flow into our lives. And if you think about it, friends, this is how, this is exactly how the kings of Israel were judged, whether they were good kings or bad, okay? They were not judged on the basis of how many wonders of the world they built, they weren't judged by the fact, you know, they built pyramids and sphinxes. They weren't judged by the size of their armies or their military prow prowess. They weren't judged by how many slaves they had under their authority, under their control. How was it that the kings of Israel were always judged? What's the phrase that you read after every king's, after the account of every king's reign? It says this, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Or he did what was wrong or evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's how a king is judged. How well did he reflect the reign of God? How well did he reflect the reign of God? Did he mediate the reign of the true God while he was king? Remember the king, king Ahab, okay? Just a, a, a brief illustration of this. Um, Ahab, according to historians, was one of the best kings that Israel ever had. I mean, he extended the boundaries of his kingdom. Um, remember, he made great treaties with, uh, by marrying Jezebel, who was a daughter of the king of Tyre and Sidon. It was, uh, it was a good, good treaty, shrewd political move. Um, he had stability in the kingdom, his, his, he had a long reign, his economy was strong, everything was good in the eyes of historians, and yet in the eyes of God, he was one of the worst kings that Israel ever had. Just remember the story of Naboth. Naboth was just an ordinary Israelite. The only thing is he, he owned a vineyard, and it happened to be right next to King Ahab's castle, and Ahab wanted it. Okay? Now, in Israel... Your, your land was your inheritance from God. It was your piece of the promised land. And it was given to you by God himself. And as long as you lived in covenant with God, 
then that land belonged to you. It didn't belong to the kings. It wasn't under their control. They were not free to take it. But in Ahab's case, like I said, he wanted the vineyard. And so he, um, he trumped up some charges against Nahab, I mean Naboth, some false charges, and he annexed his land. Put him to death, annexed his land. Now, what God said is, this is evil in my eyes. This is the strong and the powerful taking advantage of the weak. And that's the kind of thing that happens in Canaan. That's what Canaanite kings do, not Israelite kings. Because that's not reflecting God whatsoever. This was evil in God's eyes. Psalm 72 says that a king, a king delivers the needy who cry out and the afflicted who have no one to help. The king doesn't take advantage of them. The king delivers them and helps them. What Ahab had done was allowed Canaan to seep its way back into Israel. Ahab was not a portal of God's goodness. Now, verse 4 of our psalm, okay? Let me read that. Another task of the king, he will defend the afflicted among the people. He will save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. The godly king crushes the oppressor, defends the afflicted. Let's just, let's just think about that for a moment. As we said, again, one of the ways that Adam and Eve were to image God was to rule, to rule over all of the creatures that move along the ground, all of the creatures that he had created that move along the ground. Now think about this. Who was it that tempted Adam and Eve into sin? It was the serpent. It was one of those creatures that moved along the ground, that crawls along the ground. The man and the woman allowed that creature to deceive them. They did not protect the garden. They did not fulfill their role as kings. Now think back to that verse we just read, Genesis 3.15, where God says this. He says this to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. And he, that is, the seed of the woman, will strike or crush your head. That's going to happen. And you will strike or crush his heel. We talked about that back in Lent. That striking even if your heel, it's a death blow. Now what's God saying there? Well, he's saying that one day, One day, someone will come who is going to crush the head of the serpent. A true king will do what a true king is supposed to do. He will protect the garden from the serpent. He will take up his sword and cut off the serpent's head. Now, let's fast forward from Genesis to the first two kings of Israel. You remember the first challenges that they actually faced? So the first king was Saul. Saul was anointed by Samuel to be king before he was even affirmed as king by the people of Israel. He had to to deal with an enemy of Israel. The first enemy he dealt with was Nahash, king of the Ammonites. And Nahash was a nasty guy. In fact, he had besieged an Israelite city and uh, they tried to make a treaty with him and say, hey, we'll serve you forever if you let us live. And Nahash basically said, look, the only treaty I will make with you is you'll be my servants and I'm going to gouge out the right eye of everyone who lives here. Okay, so that was Nahash, not a very nice guy. And Saul had to deal with him. And Saul, we read, when he dealt with Nahash, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he crushed Nahash. And he freed the people. Now, why do I tell you that? Well, in Hebrew, do you know what the word or name Nahash means? It means serpent. It's the same word that you find in Genesis 3. And so, this was a test for Saul. It was a test to find out, are you going to be a better king than Adam was? 
Because Adam faced Nahesh, and he was deceived by him, and he let him bring chaos back into the garden. What are you going to do, Saul? And Saul, filled with the Holy Spirit, cut the head off the snake. David, okay, second king of Israel, also anointed with the Holy Spirit. Do you remember who the first enemy was that David had to fight? Remember a guy by the name of Goliath? Some of you have heard of him. Do you remember how he was described in Scripture? His armor in particular. He had scaly armor. He was another snake that David had to contend with. This was a test. What kind of king are you going to be, David? And we all know the story that David, you know, got out his slingshot and he, and he killed the giant, but oftentimes we stop there. We don't remember the rest of the story. Then he went over to the giant. He took the giant's sword and he cut off his head. He decapitated the serpent. This is what a godly king does. You cut off the head of the snake. You protect the garden. Kings are anointed with God's Holy Spirit to protect the garden. This is telling us that we need a king who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Which brings us to the next question, who? Who is this going to be, right? Verse 6, he will endure as long as the sun as long as the moon, through all generations. In other words, his reign is going to be endless. Now, that could mean very little, all right? It could just be a formality. If you remember the book of Daniel, that's how they greeted the king in the book of Daniel. They said, oh, king, live forever, right? It was just a formality. It was politeness. But it also could mean a lot. It could mean that, you know, this is how Israel came to see the Messiah, that his reign would be unending. And then combine that with the boundless realm that verse 8 speaks of, a realm from sea to sea. And then verse 11 tells us that all kings, all kings will bow to him. All nations will serve to him, serve him. In other words, his kingdom is going to be endless, it's going to be boundless, and it's going to, <clears throat> it's going to include all things, all nations, all peoples. He will reign over it all. What's the psalm telling us? That we're looking for a Messiah. We're looking for not just an anointed one, but the anointed one. What this psalm is telling us is this is not an ordinary king. No other king can fulfill this kind of expectation other than God's own anointed one, anointed fully with the Holy Spirit. That's the what. That's the who. Now let's look at the how. What are the methods of a king like this? We have to think about the how. Remember what I said about king of the mountain, right? That's how we usually think a king rules, by raw force, right? When we think of kings and we think of authority today, we think of their demands, the demands that they put on us. We think of their lust for power. They think of the things that they want from their subjects. Things like allegiance and military service and taxes, right? Kings are always demanding things. Psalm 72, however, speaks of a king in terms of what he will do for his subjects. Again, verses 12 to 14, he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He'll take pity on the weak. The needy he will rescue from oppression and violence. This is a different kind of king, friends. This is truly a servant king. In fact, verse 17 says that all nations will be blessed. It's like the promise to Abraham the godly king is someone that God is going to pour out his blessings to the whole earth through this person. He will mediate God's blessings to everyone. Eden will come through this one. But now look at how they will come. Okay, verse 10. The kings of Tarshish and of 
distant shores will bring tribute to him. They will present him with gifts. Okay? So the picture there is these kings bowing before the anointed one and bringing him gifts. All right? And these aren't just tokens of courtesy and culture. Right? Remember a couple years ago, maybe it was last year, I can't remember anymore, but the Packers were playing the Philadelphia Eagles in the, in the playoffs, and I think the mayors of Green Bay and Philadelphia got together, and the mayor of Green Bay brought cheese and brats and things from Wisconsin um, to honor the, the mayor of, of Philadelphia. And um, we're not talking about that kind of thing. Okay? We're talking about kings bowing down because they recognize in Jesus or in this anointed one that this is the rule and the reign we have always waited for and always desired. Um, let me give you a little illustration. I drank a Sprite this week. I usually don't dra- drink Sprite, <clears throat> but I did this week, and I happen to notice their theme here. It says, Obey Your Thirst. Obey your thirst, right? Make thirst your chief. Uh, make thirst your king. That's probably not a very good idea if you think about it. Um, just talk to anyone who's, you know, been associated with an alcoholic or someone who's married to someone who drinks too much Mountain Dew. Um, it's not a good idea to obey your thirst. And yet, I think that this points to something here, and it points to this idea of choosing our king and choosing our chief. You know, there's a part of us, as I said earlier, that we want to be chief and king over everything, right? Over our own lives. We don't want anyone else to tell us what to do or how to do it. And yet there seems to be another part of us that wants a chief, that wants a king over us. Someone else who is who is responsible for our well-being, responsible for our happiness, for our success. Think about it. Students want teachers who will help them learn. Um, Workers want managers who will help them be productive. Citizens want laws that will help them thrive. We're looking for a king. I don't know if you've been following a couple stories in Milwaukee, but there's one story that's been going on for a while now. City leaders have been, have been fighting with the leaders of the housing authority because um, one of the public housing complexes in Milwaukee has got hundreds of people living there, and they are totally infested with bed bugs, and they have been for years. And the people just can't get anyone to take any action. And so they can't sleep at night, and they've got sores all over their bodies, and they just, they say, it is gross. They see bed bugs all over, and no one will do anything about it. What do they want? What are they looking for? They're looking for a king. A king who's going to look out for the afflicted. Um, another example, this was, this was all over the news a, a few weeks ago, um, But there was just a a report that came out from the U.S. Surgeon General, and it's titled Parents Under Pressure. And it it says there, it reports that, listen to this, 41% of parents and caregivers said they are so stressed that they cannot function most days. And nearly 50% said their stress completely overwhelms them. 41% to 50% cannot function. You feel so much stress. Friends, it's not like our congregation is exempt from that. I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but you know who you are. What are we looking for? looking for a king. Help us, God. Help us know how to manage life 
Help us know how to manage the stresses that come with children, their schedules, social media, all of it. And, and friends, if you raised your kids 50 years ago and you think, oh, it's no different now, you're wrong. People need a king. The psalmist is telling us here that the kings of Tarshish have found the one that they have always desired to bow down to. Now, remember that picture, okay? Do you ever see that picture coming to fulfillment? I think we see the beginning stirrings of it in, in the Bible itself. Think of John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, there's a group of, of Greeks, okay, a group of Gentiles who actually come to one of Jesus' disciples. They come to Philip. You know what they say? Sir, we would like to see Jesus. You know when they come? You know what happens in John chapter 12? This is right after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem when the whole city is clamoring to make him their king. And here come the Greeks, here come the Gentiles, and they say, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. This is the king that we feel like we want and we need and have always needed. And how does Jesus respond at that time? Does he say, hey, glad you like my robes? So happy you finally realized all my potential? Yes, uh, of course I'll be your king. This is what he says. Unless a seed falls to the earth and dies... It remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus responds with self-offering and self-sacrifice. He doesn't say, yeah, let's beat down the Romans right now. Jesus responds according to Genesis 3.15. How will the true king behave? How will the one who is anointed with the Holy Spirit, how will he crush the servant? He will crush the serpent by being crushed himself. That's how the true anointed of God beats back the serpent. That's how you slay the serpent. Friends, the methods of the true king of God are so very different from anything we experience in today's world. And as Christians, we need to recognize that. And whenever we see power trying to take control of everything, even in our own lives, we have to stop and we have to say, no, this is not the way of Jesus. We are Jesus' people. He is our king. We will not do things the way of the kings of the world. Now, I know it's time to leave and you guys want to get out of here, but we just have to ask one last question. What does this mean for us? Okay, let's go back to the beginning and ask. So if we're kings, what does that look like in our lives? What does reigning with Christ really look like? Well, think of what the catechism says. It says, the, we fill the office of king by striving against sin and the devil. By striving against sin and the devil in this life. Now, in a certain sense, that sounds just like a bunch of Christianese, right? That's what we would say. Well, we fight against sin and the devil. But now let's put it in context. Put it in the bigger picture. Remember Eden, right? The serpent. It was the serpent. It was the devil who brought chaos into the garden, it was our failure as kings that turned the world into what it is now. We let the devil take control. We let sin bring the chaos back into this creation. Jesus came beating that chaos back. Jesus came fighting the serpent, right? He came healing sickness, casting out demons, preaching good news to the poor, news of flourishing, news of redemption, news of victory over the serpent. 
All of this he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Spirit. He was anointed in the Holy Spirit. Jesus was the portal, the portal of heaven between heaven and earth. And now Jesus has poured out that same Spirit on us. That same Spirit. We're never going to be the anointed one, but we are anointed by Christ Himself with that same Spirit. It's a call to battle the serpent. It's a call to beat back chaos wherever we can. And Jesus has given us what? Gifts to do that. Gifts of the Spirit. We're familiar with them. Gifts of leadership that gives order to life, or excuse me, that, that keeps people in mind as we lead, especially the last and the least. He gives us gifts of administration that give order to life so that people can thrive. He gives us gifts of service so that we can bail out the afflicted. He calls us to fight with what kinds of tools? The Word of God, prayer, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, Friends, whenever you give your students a seating chart in class that creates a better learning environment for them, you are reigning with Christ. Whenever you write some software that, that simplifies the payroll process so that your employees are treated with honor and respect, you are reigning with Christ. Whenever you tend to your marriage, like so many of you did Friday night, you stave off marital breakdown and the chaos that comes with it. You're, you're reigning with Christ. Whenever you teach your children to, to consider the fact that they are, that of how their actions affect other people, that they are not alone in the world, when you do that, you are reigning with Christ. Friends, whoever created the traffic light, for goodness sake, was doing kingdom work. Employer, employers are reigning with Christ when you let your, your employees work manageable hours and you pay them what they're worth and when they go on vacation, you let them take vacation from email as well. You're reigning with Christ. Athletic directors are reigning with Christ when you say, we're not going to overschedule our kids' sports because parents are too stressed already. 50% of them don't know how to get through another day. We're not going to do that. We're not going to allow extracurricular activities to be kings of our lives. They're not fit to do that. It's not easy to reign with Christ. And if you want to reign with Christ, you have to remember that Jesus suffered and died for the way he reigned. So don't think everyone's going to be your best friend. Don't think everyone's going to clap for you when, you when you walk the high road. And in the end, they might thank you and say, you know what, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to have Christ reigning in my life. That's if they don't kill you before that. But we are anointed with the Holy Spirit. And we have to choose every day the kingship of Christ and the way that he leads I'm just going to take a couple more of your minutes because I think this is important remember what I said about Jesus coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and what were people doing they were waving palm branches right we talked about this during Lent do you remember what the palm branches actually symbolized they symbolize the uprising of Judas Maccabeus, who was one of the insurrectionists who actually, you know, led Israel through a very, very difficult time, but he did it by the sword and in very, very bloody ways. And what's happening on Palm Sunday is basically the crowd saying to Jesus with their palm branches, we want you 
to be our king, and we want you to free us from Rome, and we want you to do it now, just like Judas Maccabeus did it. And Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, not on a brilliant white steed, like all the kings of that time did. You remember how he came in? On a donkey, or the foal of a donkey. In other words, he didn't look like a king, he looked completely silly. Because Jesus wanted nothing to do with that type of conquering, that method of cutting the head off the serpent. Fast forward about a week in time, and Jesus was standing trial before a guy by the name of Pilate. And Pilate did something that was a tradition, and he said, look, I can offer you two people. You can have Jesus the Christ, you choose. Jesus the Christ, or you can have what many manuscripts say, Jesus Barabbas, Jesus son of Barabbas, or son of Abbas. Choose. Which Jesus do you want? What did the people choose? Who did they choose? They chose Barabbas. Now, if you ever grew up in the church, you're thinking, why would anyone choose Barabbas over Jesus? Jesus is a nice guy. I mean, he did a lot of good things, right? He did miracles. He... Why choose Barabbas? Barabbas was a murderer. Barabbas is described in the Gospels as an insurrectionist. They weren't choosing necessarily Barabbas as a guy. They were choosing his methods. Violence. Powering over everybody else. That's what Jerusalem wanted. Save us, Jesus. Save us now. That's what Hosanna means. And Jesus refused to do it that way. Because Jesus knew that the only way you cut the head off the serpent is for the king, the anointed one, to offer himself. But friends, the point is, every day we face that same choice that Pilate offered the people. Do you want Jesus the Christ? Or do you want Jesus Barabbas? Who do you want for your king? And every time we choose to power up on somebody, whether it's in your family or in the office, Every time we choose the way of power and violence and greed and pride, we're choosing Barabbas. It's pretty clear. We see it. We all see it. We see it in each other. We just don't often see it in ourselves. Choose Jesus. He's the anointed one of God. He's the one filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's only when you choose that Jesus that you choose to reign like Jesus. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Come upon us in strength in power, in goodness. Let us recognize for real that the powers that can change the world are truly things like prayer, truly things like the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the self-sacrifice of Jesus the Son. Lord, Convince us that, yes, these are the tools that push back the chaos. There's no other way to do it. That we may reign with you truly. Fill us with your spirit and bring heaven to earth through us. In the name of, in your powerful name, we pray. Amen.